Tom Penn, proprietor of the new colony of Pennsylvania, is making his first trip to America. Under the charter granted by the King of England, Penn has the right to almost total sovereignty over his colony. But he's chosen to begin a bold experiment in democratic government and religious freedom, an experiment that will help to shape American ideals for many years to come. To understand the beginnings of Penn's bold experiment, we must go back 15 years to 1667. In England, as in most of Western Europe, government is closely related to religion, and Parliament has passed a law requiring all religious worship to follow the ceremonies of the official state church. This law has effect not only in England, but also in Ireland, which is ruled by England. In 1667, William Penn, who is an Englishman by birth, is living temporarily in Ireland, managing the estates owned by his father. September 3rd, 1667, in the Irish town of Cork, a meeting of a small religious group called the Society of Friends, also known as Quakers. Quaker meetings are held at night and in secret. Discovery would mean arrest and imprisonment because Quakers reject the authority of the official state church and refuse to follow its ceremonies. They believe that everyone possesses an inner light that can direct the soul to God without the help of ministers or priests or ritual worship. Among the worshipers at this meeting is a young man whose clothes and bearing mark him as an aristocrat. William Penn is the son of an admiral in the Royal Navy and a personal friend of the king. Now 23 years old, he has attended several Quaker meetings, sitting with the others in silent meditation and listening to an occasional speaker who rises at the prompting of the inner light to quote a passage of scripture or share an inspirational thought. But this particular meeting is to become a turning point for William Penn and for the Quaker movement. By accident, the meeting has been discovered by a soldier of the king. William Penn reacts not as a Quaker, but as an aristocrat insulted by a member of the lower classes. The Quaker movement opposes any form of physical violence, and Penn's outburst only proves that he's not yet a true Quaker. Later, the soldier will return with reinforcements. Penn and 18 others will be arrested, tried, and put in jail for their Quaker beliefs. After a few days, Penn is free again, but the experience has helped to change the course of his life. He's a skilled writer, and he studied law and theology. Now he's determined to use all his resources to help the Quaker movement. His writings and other activities as a Quaker will bring him into conflict with the Church of England and the royal government. More than once, he'll spend time in prison. Penn will use his knowledge of the law to defend the Quaker movement in court. Traveling to various parts of England and also to Holland and Germany, Penn preaches the doctrines of his Quaker faith. In Holland, Quakers and other religious groups are free to practice their faith without fear of persecution. William Penn is greatly impressed by the spirit of religious freedom that he's found in Holland. And by the year 1680, a bold plan has begun to take shape in his mind. In the lands claimed by England in North America, it might be possible to establish a new colony where Quakers and others might find freedom from religious persecution. There are already several settlements in North America. Virginia, established in 1607, has grown and become prosperous by 1680. And the colonies farther north are also thriving. In New England especially, but in other colonies as well, there are strict laws governing the practice of religion. New England Puritans have often persecuted the few Quakers who have settled in the northern colonies. And yet by the year 1680, the Quakers have begun to secure a small foothold in the New World. 
The titles to the New Jersey colonies have been sold by the original owners to a group of Quakers, including William Penn. New Jersey already has a settled population, but northwest of New Jersey is a large area with very few inhabitants. Here, a new colony could be established for those who suffer from religious persecution in Europe. Penn's father, who died 10 years earlier, had loaned a large sum of money to King Charles. As payment for that debt, Penn has decided to request a royal charter for a new colony in America. If he had asked the king for money, the debt would probably never have been repaid. But Penn's request for land offers King Charles a way to rid England of the troublesome Quakers, and at least partly for that reason, he grants a much larger area than Penn had asked for. The name chosen by Penn for his new province was Sylvania, which means woodland. But King Charles changes the name to Pennsylvania in honor of Penn's father. Penn plans to remain in England temporarily to prepare a form of government for his colony and recruit new settlers. Meanwhile, he commissions his cousin, William Markham, to go to Pennsylvania as deputy governor. One of Markham's responsibilities when he arrives in America is to select the location for Pennsylvania's principal city and capital to be called Philadelphia. Eventually, a site will be chosen near the junction of the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers. The city to be built here will be carefully planned to ensure the health and safety of its people. Penn wants to avoid the crowded and dangerous conditions typical of the cities of Europe. He remembers the Great Plague of London in 1665 that claimed the lives of 70,000 people and the Great Fire that nearly destroyed London in 1666. Penn's instructions to Markham are also concerned with the European settlers already living in a few small communities along the Delaware River. A total of about a thousand people, including Swedes, Dutch, and English. By royal charter, William Penn has almost unlimited authority over these people. To assure them of his good intentions, he has written a letter and instructed Markham to read it to them. My friends, I hope you will not be troubled with your change. You shall be governed by laws of your own making and live a free people. I shall not usurp the right of any or oppress his person. God has furnished me with a better resolution. Another letter from William Penn is addressed to the Indians of Pennsylvania. I am very sensible of the unkindness and injustice that hath been too much exercised toward you. But I am not such a man. I desire to win your love and friendship by a kind, just, and peaceable life. I shall shortly come to you myself, at which time we may more largely and freely confer these matters. I am your loving friend, William Penn. In October 1682, a year and a half after receiving his charter, William Penn arrives in America for the first time. He has several meetings with the Indians, as represented in this famous, although somewhat inaccurate, painting. Penn demonstrates his respect for the Indians by learning their language and paying them a fair price for their land. The Indians and the European settlers of Pennsylvania will remain at peace for a hundred years to come. By the time of Penn's arrival, work on the city of Philadelphia has already begun. Thomas Holm, the Surveyor General, has prepared a detailed plan for the city following Penn's instructions for a rectangular pattern of wide streets. In his meetings with the colonists, Penn discusses the constitution he has prepared for the Pennsylvania colony. This constitution, or frame of government, provides that anyone who believes in God will have the right to hold political office. In practice, that right will actually be restricted to Protestant Christians. And yet, for the most part, the frame of government does provide a large measure of personal and religious freedom, and it establishes other social reforms that are far ahead of their time. After less than two years in America, William Penn is forced to return to England to settle a border dispute, and more serious problems await him. Whitehall Palace in London, home of the king. In 1685, Charles II dies, 
and his brother comes to the throne as King James II. The new king is Roman Catholic, and he's bitterly opposed by the Protestants who support the established Church of England. Since William Penn is a close friend of the king, it is widely suspected that Penn has secretly become a Roman Catholic. In 1688, King James is forced to flee from England after being deposed by the Protestants. William Penn remains in England, but goes into hiding to avoid imprisonment and perhaps death. The new Protestant rulers of England are Queen Mary and her husband William of Orange. After five years with their power firmly established, William and Mary withdraw the arrest warrants against William Penn. And so in 1699, after putting his affairs in order in England, Penn returns to America to live for two years at Pennsbury, the estate that has been built for him near Philadelphia. During Penn's absence, the colony has grown rapidly. From several nations, people have been drawn to Pennsylvania to find freedom from the oppression they had known in Europe. A generous land policy has made it possible for even poorer immigrants to own their own farms. Skilled craftsmen from Germany have helped to make Pennsylvania a center of manufacturing and trade. Pennsylvania is rapidly becoming the largest of the English colonies in North America and one of the most prosperous. But Pennsylvania and all the English colonies face a threat from another world power. French claims to part of North America have already been a cause of three wars between England and France, and another war seems likely. To provide an effective defense, the English government may decide to remove Penn as governor and place Pennsylvania under direct control of the king. In 1701, to defend his charter to the colony, Penn returns to England. Pennsylvania has proved to be a costly experiment, and he's now deeply in debt. After years of controversy and hardship, he dies in England in 1718. But the colony that he established continues to grow. By this time, most of the land in eastern Pennsylvania has been claimed by earlier settlers. Newcomers from Europe are moving farther west, pushing back the frontier and clearing land for farms and homes. Philadelphia has become the largest city in the American colonies. It's a major seaport and a cultural center as well. And one of the city's buildings, the Pennsylvania State House, will become a major landmark in American history. Here, on July 4, 1776, delegates to the Second Continental Congress approved the Declaration of Independence. And 11 years later, in the same building, renamed Independence Hall, another important event takes place, the drafting of the Constitution of the United States. The principles first outlined by William Penn in his frame of government have served as a model for the federal constitution and for most of the state constitutions as well. In some ways, Penn's experiment has not been as successful as he had hoped. The colony's political leaders have not always followed his high ideals. And yet, by 1789, it has become clear that the growth of American democracy owes a great deal to the ideals of personal freedom established by William Penn in his colony of Pennsylvania.